Yeah, this should be working. Okay. Um, all right, so here's what we're going to do, my friends. Um, the information that I'm going to give you today and Wednesday, you will be held accountable for. Um, so your notes are your notes. I'm not going to give you a study guide. I'm not going to do any of that because one of the things that I've heard from um, a lot of people who come back from college um, and talk to me, they're like, high school didn't prepare me for college because college teachers don't care about you. And they just give you information, and it's your job to be responsible for it. And they don't check if you understand it or not, and they don't tell you what's going to be on the test. They just say, here's information, know all of it. So this is one of those situations in which I'm like, here's a little introduction to college. I'll, I'll probably still be nicer than not, some of your professors. Also, by the way, I've noticed that once you get into your like core co classes, except for the competitive ones, like if you're doing pre-med um, or what is the other, like engineering and these types of things. If you go down that road, I don't think it lets up at all. Um, but like if you go any of the humanities routes, that type of stuff, typically like your third and your fourth year is when you actually start to know the people in the faculty and like you have your friends and stuff and it becomes more of a supportive network. But those first two years are baptism by fire. So um, what we're going to be doing is we are going to be talking about the Enneagram. I hope they can hear because otherwise this isn't going to work. Um, we're going to talk about the Enneagram, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through why um, why the Enneagram works and what it's all about, um, and I think that's that. Um, I don't think we'll get through all of it today. What time is it? We've got about it. Your mom o'clock. Uh, uh, what? Go ahead, an hour. No, that's the other slide. This is a PowerPoint slide. I'm recording this to then post it to the YouTube later. All right. So. Um, this actually is adapted from a presentation I helped my wife put together for, it was a women's thing. So at some points, there may be some metaphors that you're like, huh? this is a women's thing. Uh, okay, so this is called Self-Knowledge as a Path to Transformation. Ten negative commandments plus nine personalities equals one uniquely broken you. Uh, sounds like a downer. Now before we get into um, the Enneagram, before we like start talking about old... Um, why, um, before we start talking about the what of the Enneagram, it's probably important that we talk about why we should even care about self-discovery, self-knowledge, personality types, ego fixations, all of that kind of stuff. Um, because now, so I don't, I don't think Gen Z struggles with this much, but I feel like the boomer version of the church does struggle with, well, self-awareness, who cares? It should just be about like reading the Bible and following God. Which I think that's, um, those are very important priorities. However, I think if you don't have self-awareness, you're going to miss something. Um, this is John Calvin, someone that a lot of Christian folks might know about. Calvin. Um, John Calvin says this, without knowledge of self, there is no knowledge of God. Without knowledge of self, there's no knowledge of God. In other words, if you, if you don't understand who you are, then it's going to be really hard to know God. If you don't understand who you are, then it's going to be really hard to relate with the divine. Um, a bit more on the mystical side of Christianity, Thomas Akempis says this, A humble self-knowledge is a surer way to God than a search after deep learning. If you want to take all of the classes on deep theological ideas, um, that might be great. But if you actually want to connect with God, one of the most direct ways to get there is to just make sure you know yourself. Um, now, um, uh, the, the thing with personality, um, is like when we do personality assessments, I think that sometimes it's like, oh, personality is this good thing. Um, but this is how Ian Cron, um, the source from Road Back to You, who's one of the big Enneagram teachers, Ian Cron, Chris Hewitz, um, Suzanne Stabile, Beatrice Chestnut, these are all really big names in the Enneagram world. Uh, but Ian Cron wrote The Road Back to You, a source that we're going to be using in a little bit. And he says this, ironically, the term personality is from the Greek word for mask, persona, reflecting our tendency to confuse the masks we wear with our true selves, even long after the threats of early childhood have passed. Now we no longer have a personality. Our personalities have us. In other words, our families... Our history, our personal background, shapes the mask that we wear. And after a while, we begin to identify ourselves with the mask that we wear. 
I'm the funny one. Like, I feel like we um, beat a dead horse in chapel with talking about labels. But the reality is, it's much more than just, like, labels. It's, no, it's a sense of identity that we put on ourselves and we wear. And so, um, like, so if you grew up in a certain type of home um, and you had to be the responsible one, well, then that's... What the, what the Enneagram does is it tries to point out the fact that that is your mask. That is not who you are, right? Um, now, some of these masks, they might be really beneficial. Some of them are not beneficial. Like, if you're like, oh, you're the smart kid, like, that might seem like it's really beneficial. However, you, you are not the smart kid. That is not who you are. You are so much more than just that label or that mask. Um, and so um, this is where... That metaphor, this is the word that you can tell it came from a women's conference. Um, my wife then was like, we are, we are not our makeup. Our makeup is not who we are, right? Because some of us have so much makeup um, that we look like this, and it's grotesque and disgusting. Um, and what we actually need is we need a set of products that can remove our makeup systematically, right? This is what personality assessments do, is that instead of being like, you're this type of personality, hooray, celebrate it. Instead, it says, how about we take that makeup off and see who you really are? How about we, like, wipe away some of the stuff that you're trying to use to cover yourself up so we can see the true you? And so the Enneagram is a tool that does this type of work. Um, old Enneagram teachers, they actually said it more like this, that there's this beautiful clay statue, um, and everyone approaches it, and this is you and your personality. But tools like the Enneagram, they take a chisel and a hammer to that clay statue. And when at first it might feel like you're just going to destroy and break the statue. But what you discover is underneath it is gold. Right? That there's actually a more beautiful, more polished, more shiny, lovely thing underneath the clay. And I think the reason that a lot of people resist doing this kind of work is I think a lot of us are afraid that if we get rid of the clay it's gonna be even worse underneath. But Enneagram teachers, their whole thing is like, no, well, how about you get rid of the claim you realize if there is a God who created all of us, who makes good things, underneath all the makeup, underneath the clay, underneath the, the facades and the labels and all that stuff, underneath that is actually something that's quite beautiful. And so that's the true self. So um, let's, let's define what the Enneagram is really quickly. Ennea is the prefix for nine. Gram means figure. So a pentagram? is a five-sided figure. A hexagram? Six. Six. A uh, diagram? Ten. Two. Oh, it's two, oh, isn't it? Two. Because it probably doesn't well, say you're a figure or some sort. Okay, um, so the Enneagram is literally, if you're like, where did they get this sacred word from? No, it just means nine-sided figure. That's what the Enneagram is. Now, if you've seen some of these in images before, um, you might be like, oh, that looks like a cult symbol. Um, or is this like Satanism or something? What is this? Um, I remember that was, so I have, I have this symbol tattooed on my back. Um, and I remember my parents being like, why do you put that Satanic symbol on your back? Um, but all that to say, the... The Enneagram just means nine-sided figure. There's different ways that it's representative, different names that people attach to each of the numbers. Um, but the purists, here's what they would do. They would just be like, no, numbers are better because what it does is it, it removes any of the attachment to any of these labels. So a nine is a nine. A nine is not a peacemaker because it might be like, peacemaker, that's a really good thing. I want to be that. Instead, it's like, no, it's just nine. And here are the tendencies of nine. Um, or like... One reformer is like a positive way of framing it versus like perfectionist is a less positive way of framing it. Achiever versus performer. Um, individualist versus romantic. Like all of these different ways are ways of talking about the numbers. And sometimes people get attached to those labels. And so for the sake of this, we're not going to really use these as much. Um, I might use them just so that, to help jog your memory. But like it'll just be like this is two. This is three. Um, now, there is a lot of logic to the Enneagram, but before we get to the logic, let's define it, other than nine-sided figure. The Enneagram, according to, um, I think this is the goof, uh, it's a description of the human psyche, which is principally understood and taught as a typology of nine interconnected personality types. 
Um, NineTypes.com says it's mainly a diagnostic tool of one's emotional outlook on life. It will not cure one's problems, but may help point out their underlying fixations. It is also also useful as a guide to how other people see their world differently. That's NineTypes.com, which is an Enneagram website. Ian Cron, the guy I cited earlier. An ancient personality typing system. It helps people understand who they are and what makes them tick. You'll notice that it's not about behaviors. It's not about things you do. It's not about, um, it's not even really about preferences. That's what the Myers-Briggs is all about. But rather, it's like, let's get into the psyche. Let's figure out your emotional outlook, your underlying fixations, and what makes you tick. It's about, let's get underneath all of that and figure out what's going on inside of there. Um, now, here's the definition that I am most enthusiastic about. Um, this is by Chris Hewards. He wrote a book called The Sacred Enneagram. Um, he also, if you ever listen to Chris Hewitt, he's really good at if, if he's talking about your number somewhere along the way, you'll feel like you got punched in the gut because you're like, oh my gosh, get out of my head. Um, or please stop reading about my trauma. Um, he says that the Enneagram is our ego's set of coping addictions that we have wrapped up around our childhood wounds so that we actually don't have to tell ourselves the truth about who we really are. Now it's a mouthful. It's our ego's set of coping addictions that we have wrapped up around our childhood wounds so that we actually don't have to tell ourselves the truth about who we really are. Um, I don't know if you, so some of these things we should probably unpack. The ego is like your, your sense of self, right? Prior to having a sense of self, you just got an id. I don't know if any of you have taken AP Psych, but it's just like, it's about satisfaction of desires and needs. The ego is like a, I am Chris, or I am Sophia, or like whoever it is that you think you are. And not only your sense of self, but like your self-esteem, all of this stuff is wrapped up in your ego. Um, so it's your sense of self and its set of coping addictions, coping meaning something bad, and addictions meaning it does it automatically and impulsively that we wrap up around our childhood wounds. So things that we experience, God bless you, um, things that we experience early in life, um, bless you twice, things that we experience early in life that have shaped the way that we are, um, we figure out ways of dealing with the world um, that are reflective of that wound. So like uh, just some like basic examples, like let's say you grew up in an unsafe home um, where you weren't sure um, if you were going to be hurt or not by someone in the family. There's a couple ways that you could wrap up some childhood. You could wrap up some coping addictions around that. Some of you, um, some people became the super responsible type that always makes sure everything's in line so that the unsafe environment wasn't as unsafe. And so you kept everything in line. And so by being the responsible, um, controlled one, then you didn't have to worry about how dangerous your home was because you had like, you were able to set up all these boundaries and walls to make your world more navigable. Or maybe since your world was so chaotic and so unsafe, um, instead you became the equally confrontational angry one. You're like, well, they're going to push me, I'm going to push back. And you become this type of person that constantly pushes back because that was the way you try to keep safe, is by pushing back against the unsafe, unsafeness. Both of them are like a childhood wounding. However, we have different coping addictions, which then later in life you have, this is why sometimes later in life you can have two people who grew up in the same home, one of them is like, totally dysfunctional, can't keep a job down and fights at bars every night. And then the other one is the super responsible kind, but they're both just wrapping up those personalities around those traumas from childhood. Now you might be like, well, I didn't have childhood trauma. Um, I had a really good home. The reality is that each of us have some sort of, and when I say trauma, I'm not, I, I don't, well, I'm not going with like the clinical definition of trauma, but each of us experiences a sense of detachment or an experience of disconnection from our primary caregivers, sometimes from the protective caregiver. Um, usually, like I feel like stereotypically, that's assigned to the dad. There's a protective caregiver and the nurturing caregiver. Um, and so usually there's a sense of detachment that occurs, which is why we feel like a sense of trauma. So sometimes it's explicit because they hit us, uh, or there was a death, or there was a divorce, or, but sometimes it's like, no, I just didn't feel like they listened. And so because of that, you felt like you detached. Or maybe it was like, okay, I, I just didn't feel like they saw me. 
and so they do detach, right? Like that is the childhood type of wounding we're talking about. All right. Now, before we even get into the system, it's one last thing I need to point out. Um, this is um, George Box. He's a British mathematician. He says this, all models are wrong, but, but some are useful. God bless you. All models are wrong, but some are useful. The Enneagram is a model. And so um, there might be places where you're like, okay, it said this thing about sevens and everything else about seven kind of fits, but this one thing doesn't fit. It's fine. It's not even perfect. It's not a perfect system. But I can tell you this, the Enneagram has been one of the most useful things to me. This is why I like tattooed it on my back. Um, is because it's been, um, for me, it's helped me understand. When, back in the past, I used to just think, that person's a jerk. And now I'm like, oh, that person has coped with their wounding in a certain way. That makes it hard to get along with them, but I totally get it. Right? It, it, can, it can inform you to compassion for others. It also will expose your darkest fears um, and make you have to confront them. Um, so the Enneagram is very useful, but it's not perfect. So and that's what I'm going to leave it at. It's useful. Um, I won't include this here, but like some people, I don't know, depending on the homes you come from, some people also have beef with the Enneagram because um, it's like attached with like mysticism and all of that. Um, if those of you who took worldview, you probably talked about New Age. Sometimes people as, uh, connect the Enneagram with New Age. The reality is that it's really uncertain where the, the, the wisdom of the Enneagram came from. Um, Christian monks, like in the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox traditions, try to claim it as their own. Um, also, like Sufi mystics within Islam try to claim it. Um, also, the New Age movement tries to claim it. Um, and so it's really, we don't really know where it came from. And so this is why I would say that, okay, the, the angle of the Enneagram that I'm going to be taking is more from like the Christian tradition angle of the Enneagram. But if you dig deep enough, you realize, oh, like all of these different traditions are kind of pointing about, out the same things about human beings. So um, this is not to supplant the wisdom of God, but rather uh, it is something that I think is actually reflected. All right. Now, um, there are three fundamental emotions. Um, the Enneagram... Um, actually deals with these three emotions um, and makes the claim that everybody has one of these three emotions playing to the bass track of your life. Now, when I say the bass track, um, when you listen to a song, oftentimes it's like the electric guitar shredding in the front or maybe like the, the of the bass note. But I don't know if you've ever like been to a concert or something. If there's no bass guitar, when the bass starts playing, you're like, this is the thing that's holding the whole thing. Right? And so the bass line, the bass note of your life, you might not feel like an angry person or a fearful person or a shameful person, but one of these three things is probably actually the thing humming the tune in the background that's holding the whole thing together. And so I'm going to go through each of these. What you'll notice is that each of these, um, you'll probably resonate with one of these more than the other um, because we, with anger, you can act it out, you can internalize it, you can control it, or you can ignore it. But either way, your fundamental fixation is anger. Or with fear, you act it out, internalize it, control, or ignore it. Right? Each of these things, you respond in different ways to it. And so you'll notice that I'm going to go through nine different explanations, three for each of these, because each of these three is connected to a different, um, a different number and then an emotional center. So let's go through anger. <clears throat> um, with these... I, I kind of want you, as, as you go along, if you're taking notes, um, if you're writing down, if you're the type of note taker that takes down everything, I would be like, okay, cool, um, you can keep doing that, but make some sort of highlight star, the ones that you're like, this resonates with my experience. Um, so externalize, deny, or control, or repress. So here's the first one. Do you externalize your anger? Raising your voice, moving forcefully, or physically acting out your anger when you feel it builds? On this type of person, anger runs. Anger is like the thing that drives their life, and it's easy for them to like just jump right into a fight. Not even a fist fight, but just like even verbal fights. It's a thing that like drives them to be like, oh yeah, like there's just something in them that wants to be confrontational. Um, or do you deny anger? Do you try your best to stay completely away from this dark feeling by being out of touch with your preferences or opinions and always focusing on idealizations of reality? Are you even a little afraid 
of your feelings of anger. You're like, no, 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 everything's cool. I'm totally chill. Everything's always awesome. No one's ever mad. Ha, 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 ha. But if you realize it, like, the thing that's under the surface is that you're deeply afraid of the fact that what might happen if you arise? What happens if you snap? Right? So you keep it deeply repressed. Or do you control or repress your anger? Do you feel that you must be perfectionistically, that you must perfectionistically stay in control of your feelings, your impulses, and yourself in general? Are you frustrated? The world around you doesn't just try harder. Right? Instead of taking um, the anger out and being like, we're going to fight, or ignoring the anger, like, what anger? Instead, you're like, okay, I'm just, I'm like a frustrated person that feels like I need to get everything right. Right? And like, you get, you get bugged when other people don't follow the rules and do things right, but you get even more devastated and bugged when you don't do something right. Right? And there's this like simmering of anger that happens there. So those are three ways we process anger. Next, shame. Um, three ways of processing shame. Do you externalize your shame? Now that might seem like a weird thing. How do you export your shame out there? But do you attempt to control your shame by getting other people to like you and think of you as a good, loving, kind person? Do you try to convince yourself that you're a good, loving person by focusing only on the positive feelings? Is your goodness determined by the emotional responses of others? If they don't love you, then I don't. Then you don't know you're loved. If they don't tell you you're good, then you don't know you're good, right? And so in order to make yourself feel like you're okay, you try to get everybody else to tell you that you're okay. Next, do you deny your shame? Do you cope with your shame by trying to become the most valuable, successful person possible? Do you ever avoid, do you avoid ever feeling shame by performing, pursuing success, and seeking acceptance from the masses? Huh, shamed of what? Look at all my trophies. Nothing to be ashamed of here. But really, it's you're just trying to... You try to win because you don't want to feel the shame, right? And then last, do you internalize your sense of shame and try to control it by focusing on how unique and special and particular your talents, feelings, and personal characteristics are? Do you find yourself fantasizing often to deal with your feelings of disappointment about yourself? In other words, you just internalize your shame and you're like, yes, my shame is me and I'm different and weird, but that's what makes me special, but I also hate it, but I also love it. I wish I wasn't so different and I could be like everybody else. But if I was like everybody else, how lame and dumb that would be. And so I dress differently. I listen to weird music that no one else likes. I do types of art that no one is into. I'm special. And that makes me feel sad, but happy that I'm sad. All right. Fear. Fear. Do you externalize your fear? Do you isolate yourself, perhaps, as an attempt to cope with your fear of the outer world? Do you find yourself trying to absorb as much information as possible to help reduce your fear of the outside world? In other words, out there is a big, scary place, so I'm going to withdraw from all of it and just observe it from a distance and see if I can calculate, figure out, understand why all these things are happening there. And then if I fully feel like I understand all of this stuff, then maybe I'll wade into the conversation. But otherwise, I'm out here. Because that's scary, and I'd rather just observe it and make my judgments about it. Or do you internalize your fear and use it to drive your search for security? Do you turn to religion, relationships, jobs, or authorities to protect you from your fears? Are you skeptical of those who might jeopardize your security? Um, this type of way of dealing with your fear is kind of ambivalent because you're like, I want to trust authority figures because I want someone in my life that'll tell me what's best for me, but I also distrust them. Because people are distrustful and can hurt you. And so I'm like, you're, you're in this limbo of like, I want to just fully buy in, but I'm also afraid. And like, so there's this baseline level of anxiety in your life. Always. Last, do you forget your fear? Do you work hard to avoid any feelings of pain, loss, and deprivation by distracting yourself with new ideas, new experiences, and entertaining yourself? And like, well, if I just have a lot of fun, always... Nothing to be afraid of. What fear? Life's great. Oh, that thing that happened in the past, I already forgot about it because I moved on to the next thing. Hey, have you ever um, tried mixing Ambien and alcohol? Alcohol? <laughs> That's that kind. And so, I want you to take note um, of the ones that resonate most with you. Um, 
Oh, Here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn and talk to your person sitting next to you just really quickly. Have a quick conversation. Which of these three emotions um, sounded the most like you as I explained it? Um, and it was, was it like the living it out, internalizing it, or pretending it doesn't exist? Which of those exist? If you're like, I have no idea, um, then that's okay. Just be like, I have no idea, but, and then try to have that conversation. Ready, go. Which I control anger. I I feel like anger is internalized, I was so ashamed and fear is I try to forget fear, control anger, internalize it. Yeah. Yeah. Forget fear. 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 You? Um, <laughs> externalize shame and internalize. Fear. I don't know how much of the anger thing I relate to, but I'm like, it's a little bit of control on that. Really? Huh? Say you said Baha. No, you didn't no. say atomic. You just said let me know Baha. Oh, be wild. Yeah. No, I think I'm. Huh? Are there more feelings? I, 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 there are more feelings. Oh, okay. Yeah, but these are the three yeah. fundamental feelings. Yeah. Yeah. There is no happy or sadness. <laughs> oh, that's right. No, or no, sorry, joy. Sorry. All right. Here's what we're going to do. Um, before I get into each of the Enneagram types, um, I, I need to clarify something. Friends, this is red. Okay, nice. <laughs> um, and so you might be like, cool, yeah, that's red, and I can identify that as red. But this is also red. This is red, and this is red, and this is red, and these, also red. these are also red. All of these are red. And so you might be like, yeah, I'm red, but I'm not red. You know what I mean? Like, I'm this kind of red, not that kind of red. And so in the Enneagram, there's actually, an, um, if you ever do any research on the Enneagram Institute, like even reading about the numbers, um, it talks about like, they give like nine or 10 different scales of healthiness. So like a really, really healthy three looks polar opposite from a really, really unhealthy three. A really, really healthy nine looks very different than a really, really unhealthy nine. And so you might be like, you might hear me say that, like, Bob Dylan was a five with a four wing, and you're like, I'm a five with a four ring wing, but I don't play guitar, and I don't write songs. Um, you know what I mean? Like, you might be like, what? Um, I'm a marine biologist. How can I be a five with a four wing? Well, it's because there's great diversity in each of these numbers. One, in the way that they flesh them out. Um, another one that there's just, it would be impossible to go through all of this stuff, but um, the each type has a sub three, there's three instinctive subtypes. Um, so it's actually 27. Um, types, because there's a sexual, social, and self-preservation instinct that people have, and the way that those, it's even more than 27, because the way that each of those three are ordered affects the way you interact, because the, even the number that I identify with, or that I'm like, yes, this is my weird coping mechanism, if you ask almost any other person who has the same number as me, they're very different externally, but it's because of the way, like, my instinctive drives are different, which is why I live out that number differently. So all that to say... If nothing matches you perfectly, well, good. It means you're human, um, and there's diversity, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to work through each of the nine types. What I, if you are a an avid note taker, I would say like make sure you get some of the key points of each. But with each of these, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through. Uh, I'm going to read through some, um, like some explanations of what it's like to be that number. And as you go through that number, I want you to make like little if you're the writing kind, make little check marks of each of the statements that align with you. Um, 
Because if you think about it, this is why when I'm like, if you took the Enneagram quiz, it might not be all that accurate. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you some statements. And that's essentially the same. It's like, which of these do I identify with? What quizzes and these types of questionnaires do is that helps you know what you're not, for sure. Right? Um, but then if there's a few that you're like, I resonated a lot with these three, um, then it's best to then be like, okay, let's look at the fundamental drives. Let's do some self-reflective work and see which of these actually represents what I think the most. So I'll walk you through the summary of each of these, and then I'll read um, some things from Ian Morgan Cron's book, The Road Back to You. I think he co-authored it with Suzanne Stabile, but I think they had a falling out, so here we are. Um, but I think Ian was the, the main author of the book, or like the, the guy whose name was big on the book. Um, so we're going to start with the eight. The reason we're starting with eight, by the way, um, is if you look at this diagram, um, you'll notice that there's something called the action center, the feeling center, and the thinking center. Action, um, this is the, these are the anger, shame, fear. And so instead of starting at one and then coming all the way back to the same center, we're going to start at eight and work our way through this center, through this center, and through this center. So we'll start at eight and end at seven. Um, eight. The Enneagram eight sometimes is called the challenger. Um, they are the powerful, dominating type. Self-confident, decisive, willful, confrontational, commanding, and intense. They are motivated by a need to be strong and avoid feeling weak or vulnerable. This is the eight. The basic fear is of being harmed or controlled by others. Basic desire to protect themselves or to be in control of their own life and destiny. Um, trying to think of Mr. Langston, I believe, identifies as an eight. If you've seen him coach, it kind of makes sense. Yeah? Um, even, even the way he preaches is very eight, right? Like, he'll, he'll get passionate about God and be like, boom, I'm going to tell you the things that are and that is true. And I'm going to say the thing that you need to hear from God right now. That's, that's eight. Um, all right, with each of these, I'm going to read through 20 statements that eights would say about themselves. And so, again, as I read through each of these, just make a little check mark. Uh, either a check or a hat, you know, the chicken scratch, like hash marks. Anyway, um, so as I read through these, like, make a check mark for everyone that resonates. Can we write the question that you're saying, too? No, it's not a question. It's just, like, these are just statements. So, like... Just kind of to add up, like, how many, yeah, how many, yeah, how many of these, like, resonate with your experience? Oh, how many? Yeah. Um, it's like one. Okay. Yep. Totally. Yep. Yes. Number. One. I've, I've been told that I'm too blunt and aggressive. Two. Doing things halfway is not my spiritual gift. Three. I enjoy a good verbal skirmish, just to see what others are made of. Four. Right. In relationships that matter to me, I insist on being honest about conflicts and staying in the fight till things are worked out. Five, it's hard for me to trust people. Six, justice is worth fighting for. Seven, I can sniff out other people's weakness the first time I meet them. Eight, saying no isn't a problem for me. I welcome opposition. Bring it. Ten, I make decisions fast and from the gut. Eleven, I don't like it when people beat around the bush. Twelve, I'm wary of people who are super nice. Thirteen, when I walk into a room, I know immediately who has the most power. Fourteen, I don't have much respect for people who don't stand up for themselves. Fifteen, one of my mottos is a good offense is better than a good defense. Sixteen, don't mess with the people I love. Seventeen, I know I'm respected, but sometimes I want to be loved. Eighteen, I have no problem confronting a bully. Nineteen, if God wanted people to wear their hearts on their sleeve, he would have put it there. 20. Under my tough exterior is a tender, loving heart. So that's what it's like to be an eight. Um, so maybe, so at, even as you, I go through some of these, you might be like, okay, that's not me. But I definitely know someone who's like that. Um, that, that might be, this might be even helpful in that. All right. Nine. Nines. Sometimes they're called the peacemaker. They are the easygoing, self-effacing type. In other words, self-softening, like they'll soften themselves for the sake of others. They are receptive, reassuring, agreeable, and complacent. Pleasant, laid back, and accommodating. They're motivated by a need to keep the peace, merge with others, and avoid conflict. Their basic fear is of loss and separation. Their basic desire to have inner stability and peace of mind. Um... 
Now, you might not understand how anger could be related to the nine, but here's, here's how this worked with nines. Nines, because they're constantly trying to just merge with others, um, because they're trying to avoid conflict constantly, because they're always trying to be agreeable and reassuring, they try to just forget that they even have preferences so that they can just do what everyone else wants. The reality, though, is that they do actually have preferences. And so each time they do that, it like just builds this huge debt of, of frustration and anger with reality that actually, if they let themselves put their guard down, they discover that there's a, a boiling pool of lava underneath all of that. But everyone's like, oh, that person, they're so chill, they're so cool, they're so relaxed. So Enneagram 9's, um, 9 is uh, nine is the type that I identify with for a long time. Once we get to 3, um, it'll make sense. I mistyped as 3 for a long time, but then 3's, they're all about winning, and I like feel super bad when I win, because I don't like other people to feel bad when I win, which is like, oh, this kind of makes sense. Um, also, I discovered that shame is definitely not the thing going on inside of me. Like, I'm not like embarrassed or shameful about things. Um, and I'm not really scared, so which is always weird when pastor preachers are like, everyone faces, like, deals with fear. I'm like, oh, they do. Um, but the thing that I'm actually afraid of is like my own anger. Um, I'm afraid of like what happens if I stop being chill. Um, and then, yeah, once I when I do allow myself to feel things, I discover that underneath it, it's all it's all just frustration and anger. Like that's what's bubbling. Here's what it's like to be a nine. Bubbles. Bubbles. What? Bubbles. <laughs> Bubbles. <laughs> I'll do almost anything to, remember, hash marks if any of these resonate. I'll do almost anything to avoid conflict. I'm not a self-starter. Sometimes I get lost in doing trivial tasks, while things that really need to get done get put off. So like, you know, you have that homework assignment, but you're like, oh, the dishes need washing. Um, I'm happy to go along with what others want to do. I tend to procrastinate. People seem to want me to be more decisive. When I get distracted and go off task, I give my attention to whatever's happening right in front of me. I often choose the path of least resistance. I find routines at work and home comforting, and I feel unsettled when something throws them off. Others see me as more peaceful than I really am. I have a hard time getting started, but once I do, I really get things done. I'm a what-you-see-is-what-you-get person. I don't think of myself as being very important. People think I'm a good listener, even though I find it hard to pay attention in a long conversation. I don't like to take work home with me. Sometimes I tune out and think about the past. I don't enjoy big social gatherings as much as a quiet evening at home with the ones I love. Being outdoors is very soothing for me. I'm often quietly stubborn when people put demands on me. It would feel selfish to spend a whole day doing whatever I want to do. Is it nines? Mm. Nines are like tofu. I love tofu. Which kind though? Tofu oh, tastes true. like whatever it's cooking in. You know what I mean? Which kind? Your mom? Okay. So. okay. What? Uh, All right. Enneagram type one. Your mom. Enneagram type ones, sometimes they're called the perfectionist, sometimes they're called the reformer, um, but it's because they can't deal with things being broken. Um, and so they fix them. The rational, idealistic type, principled, purposeful, self-controlled, perfectionistic, ethical, dedicated, and reliable. They are motivated by a desire to live the right way, improve the world, and avoid fault and blame. Their basic fear is of being corrupt and evil or defective. Basic desire to be good, to have integrity, to be balanced. I wonder if we have any ones on staff anymore. Mounde was a one. The other Mounde, Mrs. Mounde was a one. Um, Mrs. Sinner, who no longer is here, which is ironic. Um, the one. Cops. I don't know if she's a uh -oh. one. I think she identifies as a seven. Uh, but anyway. Oh, here's, by the way, here's another way. If you're like unsure of which of these um, you are, um, or which of these is your coping mechanism, sometimes um, phrasing the basic fear as an insult um, is, is one of the best ways. So if you're an eight, um, if someone told you you're a pushover and you're powerless, like if that's the thing that makes you be like, oh, shut up, 
Um, maybe eight. Oh. Um, nine? It's like, um, hey, you can't be close to anyone. No one wants to be with you. Uh, that would be the ninth. Um, one, you're defective. You're broken. Something's wrong with you. Like, those would be the words that are like, ouch. Yes. Oh, interesting. I'll talk to her. Maybe. They all sound like emotional. Things. Okay. <laughs> Here's what it's like to be a Juan. <laughs> Again, check marks if it resonates. Oh. oh, that's right. People have told me I can be overly critical and judgmental. I beat myself up when I make mistakes. I don't feel comfortable when I try to relax. There's too much to be done. I don't like it when people ignore or break the rules. Like when the person in the fast lane at the grocery store has more items than allowed. <laughs> Details are important to me. I often find that I'm comparing myself to others. If I say I'll do it, I'll do it. It's hard, please stop. Uh, <laughs> it's hard for me to let go of resentment. I think it is my responsibility to leave the world better than I found it. I have a lot of self-discipline. I try to be careful and thoughtful about how I spend money. It seems to me that things are either right or wrong. I spend a lot of time thinking about how I could be a better person. Forgiveness is hard for me. I notice immediately when things are wrong or out of place. I worry a lot. I'm really disappointed when other people don't do their part. I like routine and don't readily embrace change. I do my best when working on a project, and I wish others would do the same, so I wouldn't have to redo their work. I often feel like I try harder than others do, uh, than others do, than others to do things correctly. I feel I feel like I try harder than others to do things correctly. That's what it's like to be a one. All right, this, that's the end of the gut triad or the anger triad. We're moving into the shame, shame triad. Enneagram type two. Sometimes they're called the helper. They are the caring, interpersonal type, generous, demonstrative, people pleasing, and possessive. Warm, caring, and giving. They are motivated by a need to be loved and needed and avoid acknowledging their own needs. Their basic fear of being unwanted, unworthy of being loved. The basic desire to feel loved. So to a two, probably the biggest, um, the biggest insult to them would be like, no one wants you. No. no one loves you. No one wants you. I know. <laughs> I love you, Samuel. So probably not a two. Um, <laughs> so the other thing with, um, so my wife is a two. Um, my wife. My wife. Um, she's a two. And here's the thing about twos, is that oftentimes they are the people that like are quickest to make you feel like you are loved, and they are the people that make you feel accepted. They are the ones who like, they're like, why am I telling you my life story? I just met you. Those are twos, which is a beautiful thing. I also find, listen, I also find that Christian females mistype as two a lot. Um, and it's because Christianity, I think, tries to impose that this is what a Christian woman is supposed to look like. Um, but oftentimes, here's why the underlying thing is more important than the symptom. Because you could be a really inviting, welcoming, loving person. However, why? Twos, the reason they do this is because they're like, if I am nice and kind and loving to everybody else, then maybe I could get the same love that I really deeply desire. Like, I, I can't confront the fact that I actually need this love. I can't say that out loud because that's too embarrassing to say that I'm needy. But I'm going to be nice to everybody and hopefully someone just pays me back. Hopefully someone just loves me back. Right, so it's out of a sense, like, not to, like, throw twos under the bus, but they're nice because they want to be loved, not because they're nice. Um, they're nice because they want to be, like, accepted, and for someone, without being told, just to reflect back the love that they wish um, they could have. Anyway, all right, here's what it's like to be a two. When it comes to taking care of others, I don't know how or when to say no. I'm a great listener. And I remember the stories that make up people's lives. I am anxious to overcome misunderstandings in a relationship. I feel drawn to influential or powerful people. People think I'm psychic because I usually know what other people need or want. Even people I don't know well share deep stuff about their lives with me. 
It seems like people who love me should already know what I need. I need to be acknowledged and appreciated for my contributions. I'm more comfortable giving than receiving. I like my home to feel like a safe and welcoming place for family and others. I care a great deal about what people think of me. I want other people to think I love everyone, even though I don't. I like it when the people who love me do something unexpected for me. Lots of people ask me for help, and it makes me feel valuable. When people ask me what I need, I have no idea how to answer. When I'm tired, I often feel like people take me for granted. People say my emotions can feel over the top. I feel angry and conflicted when my needs conflict with others. Sometimes it's hard for me to watch movies because I find it almost unbearable to see people suffer. I worry a lot about being forgiven when I make mistakes. This is the two. Oh, can you read the first three then? The first three were, when it comes to taking care of others, I don't know how or when to say no. I'm a great listener and I remember the stories that make up people's lives. I am anxious to overcome misunderstandings in a relationship. Enneagram type three. These are called the achiever or the performer. Success-oriented pragmatic types. Pragmatic seems like such a good thing, but you'll see why it's that. Adaptable, excelling, driven, and image conscious. Success-oriented, image conscious, and wired for productivity. They're motivated by a need to be, or at least appear to be, successful and to avoid failure. Basic fear of being worthless. Basic desire to feel valuable and worthwhile. This is why they collect trophies. Um, and maybe not literal trophies, but they have a list of successes. They have a list of things that they've won. Um, they are competitive, almost to a fault. And if they do lose, oftentimes there's a good reason why they lost and they're happy to tell you why. Right? Oh, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night and that's why I didn't get the highest grade on the test. Um, oh, well, you know, I didn't really try very hard my sophomore year, and so this is why I'm not the valedictorian. But there's always a reason why, right? Um, and so that they can, like, re like they'll, what they'll do is they'll make, even their, even their failures, they'll make them look like successes. I mean, it's, again, twos, it's because of having, like, this internalized sense of shame, and they need other people to tell them um, that they're loved. Threes, they're like, I'm not embarrassed of anything. I haven't failed, I haven't messed up, I'm great. Um, here's what it's like to be a three. Oh, three's in my life, where's some three's in my life? Uh, shoot, I don't know if I... <laughs> um, wing has to be next to me, eight's in the eight. Yeah, wings are next to me. I'm like tired right now. All right, yeah, yeah and so, so for example, as we go through these, I don't know. Yeah, as we go through each of these, you might be like, oh, there's some, some of these other things. Pay attention. That's why you're checking things off is because there are, like, there's connections here. So, for example, um, three, seven, and eight both are assertive types. Or all three are assertive types, and so you might find that you have all three of these types of things there. Um, nines, fours, and... No, nines, fours, and fives are withdrawn stances. Um, one, two, and six are dependent stances. Um, also, that like when a nine is in health, they move this way, and when they're dysfunctional, they move this way. Um, you might find that there's like, um, if you are an eight that sometimes has two behaviors, or two who has sometimes has eight behaviors, it's because in health and dysfunction, they go different ways. Um, so my wife, when she's in an unhealthy place, becomes like controlling and aggressive. But when she's like really in a good place, she gets all crafty and does like artsy things. Um, so if there's things that stand out to you, um, that's why you're noting everything is because all of these things are interconnected. All right. Here's what it's like to be a three. Ready? <laughs> it's important for me to come across as a winner. I love walking in a room and knowing I'm making a great first impression on the crowd. I could persuade Bill Gates to buy a Mac. Nope. The keys to my happiness are efficiency, productivity, and being acknowledged as the best. I don't like it when people slow me down. I know how to airbrush failure so it looks like success. I'd rather lead than follow any day. I am competitive to a fault. 
I can find a way to win over and connect with just about anyone. I'm a world champion multitasker. I keep a close watch on how people are responding to me in the moment. It's hard for me to not take work along on vacation. It's hard for me to name or access my feelings. I'm not one to talk much about my personal life. Sometimes I feel like a phony. I love setting and accomplishing measurable goals. I like other people to know about my accomplishments. I like to be seen in the company of successful people. I don't mind cutting corners if it gets the job done more efficiently. People say I don't know how or when to stop working. Enneagram. Hmm. Let's move deeper into our shame and explore what it's like to be a four. Yeah. The Enneagram type four, sometimes called the romantic. Um, the sensitive, introspective type. Don't be misled by it. Actually, we talked about romantic poets, so that's the type of romantic we're talking about. Expressive, dramatic, self-absorbed, temperamental. Creative, sensitive, and moody. They are motivated by a need to be understood. Experience their oversized feelings and avoid being ordinary. Their basic fear is that they have no identity or no, no personal significance. Another basic fear would be like, you're just like everybody else. You're a normal, you're a cog. Uh, basic desire to find themselves and their significance to create an identity. The sad reality for most fours is that there's this constant journey to find themselves, so they're constantly doing different, like others might call it, weird things, but in the whole process, they still feel like they haven't found it. If you ask a four, how are you doing? If you gave them a moment to actually think, their response would be, something's missing. That's how fours feel about reality. Um, here's what it's like to be a four. I like things that are unconventional, dramatic, and refined. I'm definitely not a fan of the ordinary. I never really felt like I belonged. I have so many feelings in a day, it's hard to know which ones to pay attention to first. Some people think I'm aloof, but I'm really just unique. In social situations, I tend to hang back and wait for others to approach me. Melancholy is comfortable for me, so it's annoying when people try to cheer me up. I'm not like everyone else. Phew. I'm very sensitive to criticism, and it takes a while, it takes me a while to get over it. I spend a lot of time trying to explain myself. When people tell me what to do, I'm often tempted to do the opposite. Sometimes I just disappear and go radio silent for a few days. I'm okay with sad songs, sad stories, and sad movies. Overly happy people give me a headache. I feel like there's something, I feel like there is something essential lacking in me. It's really hard for me to settle into a relationship because I'm always looking for my ideal soulmate. I'm self-conscious. It's hard for me to find my place in a room full of people. People say I'm too intense and my feelings overwhelm them. I'm either an artist or highly creative. I come up with one amazing creative idea after another. It's executing them that's hard. Lots of people misunderstand me and it makes me frustrated. I pull people in, but then I get nervous and push them away. I worry a lot about abandonment. This is one of our close friends, Janelle, um, is uh, she's a four, and she's like an artsy, she's a photographer, she leads worship sometimes, um, she does all sorts of artsy things, but then there's also like this, like, sadness that she's comfortable with and just likes to be around. All right, we're moving into the fear instincts. Um, we might not get all the way through all uh, all of them, uh, so that's why you got to keep tabs. Enneagram type five is sometimes called the investigator, sometimes called the observer or the scientist. The intense cerebral type. Perceptive, innovative, secretive, and isolated. They're analytical, detached, and private. They're motivated by a need to gain knowledge, conserve energy, and avoid relying on others. Their basic fear is being useless, helpless, or incapable. Their basic desire to be capable, capable and competent. 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 I were helpless. <laughs> Um, so yeah, think about it. Like this one, your the insult would be like you're you're incapable, you're incompetent. I know, man. Oh, oh. Right, and because think about it. For a so for a five, this is their way of staying safe. They find their area of competency, they execute on that, but then they withdraw in all other places. Right, they're the person that. A group of friends is having a conversation, and they're completely silent until you bring up the thing that they know they have expertise in, and then they'll talk all day, all, all day long, oh, right? But yes. go go back to talking about normal everyday stuff. They're like they'll they they sink back into the shadows. Right? My friend Robert, who married Janelle, is a five, so it's ironic because the fives are the most withdrawn, secretive, don't express emotions. Um, and then the four is the everything is an emotion. Um, and so it's fun to watch them do marriage. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a unique experience. All right. So here's what it's like to be a five. I can take care of myself, and I think others could do the same. I don't always say things out loud, but in my head, I'm pretty sarcastic and cynical. I often feel awkward around other people. I'm okay if people ask me a few specific questions about myself, but I don't like it when people want too much information. I need time alone. If I want people to know how I feel, I will tell them. I generally wish they wouldn't ask. <laughs> I think thoughts are more reliable than feelings. I need a couple of days to process an experience or know how I feel about something. People are wasteful. I hold on to what I have. Often, I find that I would rather observe than participate. I can take care of, oh, sorry. Um, I trust myself. That means I think about things for a while and then I make my own decisions. I can't understand why people get together just to hang out. <laughs> I'm a listener. I have to be very careful with my time and energy. I get tired when I have to be with people for too long. I often felt invisible as a child. Sometimes as an adult, I choose to be invisible. Sometimes I think I should, so, what? Were, were those two combined? Uh, yes. So I often felt invisible as a child, so sometimes as an adult I choose to be invisible. Sometimes I think I should be more generous. It's hard for me. In groups, being uninformed makes me very uncomfortable. I don't like big social gatherings. I'd rather be with a few people. Material possessions don't make me happy. This is the five. And here's the six. The, uh, some say that the six is the um, most common type, which if you're a four, that probably makes you be like, please don't be this one, please don't be this one, please don't be this one. <laughs> uh, the, the sixes, though, they're the ones that make sure we don't jump off cliffs. Um, they're called the loyalist, the committed, security-oriented type, engaging, responsible, anxious, and suspicious, committed, practical, and witty. They're worst-case scenario thinkers. Um, who are motivated by fear and the need for security. It kind of seems like they're a stick in the mud, but actually sixes sometimes are the funniest people because they're so aware of the things that are uh, like fear, like scary and can go wrong. Also, because they need a sense of security, they also tend to build a group of people around them by being funny. Um, and they're like, cool, that we're all laughing about some of the same stuff. Yes, sir. Six is really connected to two. Yeah, they're both dependent stances. Oh, yep. yeah, yeah. Twos, though, it's out of a need to be loved, but six is their basic fear of being without support and guidance. Their basic desire to have security and support. So, so for a six, they're like, if I don't have a group of people around me, I won't be taken care of. For twos, if, I, if I'm not nice to everybody, then I'm, un, then I'm unlovable. Yes? Is there a reason we started with eight and not one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's why yeah. I Because we're starting at the, at the instinctive uh, centers. Okay. And then we're going to end with seven. Yeah. All right. Um, lots of, I know, I know lots of sixes, um, and I'm sure you do too. Um, here we go. Oh, there's also a six counter, each of these has a counter type, um, which means that they kind of display this differently. And so you can be a six and just be like the, I just want to follow the authority and have people around me who um, love and care about me and we have this good, safe community. And then there's other sixes who are like, I just trust every authority figure who wants to control me because they might want to hurt me. Right? Uh, um, and so, but it's out of the same sense of like fear and anxiety. Okay, here's six. I'm always imagining and planning for the worst. Yep. 
I often don't trust people who are in authority. People say I am loyal, understanding, funny, and compassionate. Most of my friends don't have as much anxiety as I do. I act quickly in a crisis, but when things settle down, I fall apart. When my partner and I are doing really well in our relationship, I find myself wondering what will happen to spoil it. Being sure I've made the right decision is almost impossible. I'm aware that fear has dictated many of my choices in life. I don't like to find myself in unpredictable situations. I find it hard to stop thinking about the things I'm worried about. I'm generally not comfortable with extremes. I usually have so much to do, it's hard for me to finish tasks. I'm most comfortable when I'm around people who are pretty much like me. People tell me I can be overly pessimistic. I am slow to start, and once I do get started, I find myself continuing to think about what could go wrong. I don't trust people who give me too many compliments. It helps me to have things in some kind of order. I like to be told I'm good at my job, but I get very nervous when my boss wants to add to my responsibilities. I have to know people for a long time before I can really trust them. I am skeptical of things that are new and unknown. The six. And just while we have the six to reference, the sevens, I'll just do the quick intro to these and then we'll, we'll refresh on this next time we're together. Sevens, the busy, variety-seeking type, spontaneous, versatile, acquisitive, and scattered. Fun, spontaneous, and adventurous. They are motivated by a need to be happy, to plan stimulating experiences, and to avoid pain. Their basic fear of being in pain. Uh, their basic desire to be satisfied and content, to have their needs fulfilled, but more than their needs, like they want... They want their desires fulfilled, too. Um, almost every seven that I know struggles with some sort of substance because substances make life feel good, and sevens want to feel good. Right? Sometimes it's drugs. Sometimes it's caffeine. Sometimes it's alcohol. Okay. Sometimes that would go under the drugs category. Um, <laughs> but yes, and sevens, it's also out of fear. They just are afraid of feeling pain, and so they, they don't want to. And so that's how sevens cope with it. We'll, we'll go through the, what it's like to be a seven when we get back together on Monday. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Hey, you're going to get food, right? Where? No, I'm